Thank you very much, Paul. I'm going to take the liberty of uh, speaking rather quickly this morning since I have distributed an outline to you. I suppose it will be a little bit easier to follow that way. I found out after getting here that the time constraints were greater than I had uh, planned on when I wrote the lectures originally. But if I get going too fast and it just begins to sound like tongues or something, you raise your hand and I'll stop. I'm honored by and, of course, grateful for the seminary's invitation to deliver these lectures today in tribute to the life and the apologetical achievement of Dr. Cornelius Van Til, who was my former professor. The invitation to present the Van Til lectures came with the specific request that I address the subject of the antithetical nature of the Christian faith. And as anyone who is familiar with the corpus of Van Til's publications and writings will recognize, the subject of antithesis is one fitting hallmark of his scholarly contribution to 20th century apologetical theory. It was in the interest of antithesis that Van Til wrote his first major classroom syllabus, now entitled A Survey of Christian Epistemology, stating that, and I quote him, it is necessary to become clearly aware of the deep antithesis between the two main types of epistemology, Christian and non-Christian. It was in the interest of antithesis that Van Til published his first major book on the crisis theology of Barth and Bruner, entitled The New Modernism, hoping to alert the Christian church to the fact that Barth's dialectical theology was fundamentally one with modernistic theology, and that, and I quote him, the new modernism and the old are alike destructive of historic Christian theism, and with it of the significant meaning of human experience. It was in the interest of a proper understanding of antithesis that Van Til in the next year published his second book on the subject of Common Grace, where the fundamental premise was that the believer and the non-believer differ at the outset of every self-conscious investigation. And perhaps the most memorable section of Van Til's basic text in Apologetics, The Defense of the Faith, is precisely his treatment of the mock dialogue between Mr. Black, the unbeliever, Mr. White, the Reformed apologist, and Mr. Gray, the Evangelical apologist, who does not appreciate the significance of the philosophical antithesis between belief and unbelief with disastrous consequences for his apologetical argumentation. This theme of the principial, epistemological, and ethical antithesis between the regenerate, Bible-directed mind of the Christian and the autonomous mind of the sinner, whether expressed by the avowed unbeliever or by unorthodox modern theologians, remained part of Van Til's distinctive teaching throughout his career. Indeed, his feshrift bears the pertinent title, Jerusalem and Athens, based on Tertullian's famous antithetical quip, what indeed has Athens to do with Jerusalem? What concord is there between the academy and the church? In his own essay for that volume, entitled My Credo, Van Til condensed his conception of apologetics guided by the thought of antithesis into a concluding summary where he wrote, My own proposal, therefore, for a consistently Christian methodology in apologetics is this, that we no longer make an appeal to common notions which Christian and non-Christian agree on, but to common ground which they actually have because man and his world are what Scripture says they are. That we set the non-Christian principle of the rational autonomy of man against the Christian principle of the dependence of man's knowledge on God's knowledge, as revealed in the person and by the Spirit of Christ. That we claim, therefore, that Christianity alone is reasonable for men to hold, that we argue by presupposition. I wish to take these Van Til lectures, then, to address the subject of the antithetical nature of Christianity and its significance for apologetics. It was one of the burdens of Van Til's later essay toward a Reformed apologetics to urge Reformed apologists not to be philosophical or speculative first, then biblical afterwards. Rather, said Van Til, if we would be true to the Christ of Scriptures, we must first listen to his word in the Bible and from that starting point proceed to think through all philosophical issues. Van Til ended this pamphlet with these words. Rather than wedding Christianity to the philosophies of Aristotle or Kant, we must openly challenge the apostate philosophic constructions of men by which they seek to suppress the truth about God themselves in the world. It is only if we demand of men complete submission to the living Christ of the Scriptures in every area of their lives that we have presented to men the claims of the Lord Christ without compromise. 
It is only then that we are truly biblical first and speculative afterwards. Only then are we working toward a reformed apologetic. Now, we'll strive today to emulate the method of being biblical first by commencing our considerations with a survey of the biblical view of the antithesis between believer and unbeliever. This brings me then to the first major point in the outline distributed to you. The antithesis is crucial to the biblical understanding of man. Genesis 3, verse 15 reads, And I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you will bruise his heel. A correct view of man, his historical setting and problem, and God's resultant relationship to man is tied up with the biblical presentation of the fall of man and God's response to it. Genesis 3.15 is often designated the Proto-Evangelium, the first proclamation of good news for man's salvation. However, that good news of the victorious confrontation of the Savior with Satan cannot be understood except against the background of what precedes it. There is preceding it, of course, first, the fact that man's guilty conscience created alienation between him and his wife, as well as a desire to flee from the presence of God. And two, the fact that God's curse was pronounced against the serpent precisely because he dared to beguile man into repudiating the self-establishing authority of God's word. Both of these facts point to the spiritual antithesis inherent in the present human situation, but more pointedly, that antithesis is explicitly declared by God in verse 15, where he said that he will put enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, between the children of God, who are united to their Savior, and the children of the devil, as we read in John 8.44. I think it's worth noting that the emphasis falls upon the word enmity as the first word in the Hebrew of Genesis 3.15. Enmity will I put, God said. And God himself is said to constitute, establish, and deliberately impose this enmity between men. The opposition and antithesis between followers of God and followers of Satan is not simply predicted by God and it's not simply commanded. It is sovereignly inflicted as God's judicial curse. The distinction and antipathy between the two seeds must and indeed will be maintained. Only in that light do we properly understand and hope and the Messiah's crushing defeat of the tempter. Were that antithesis disregarded, diluted, or dispelled, the very meaning of the gospel of salvation would be lost, either by consigning all men indiscriminately to the perdition of Satan, or by neglecting the discriminating love of God, which Paul says in Colossians 1, delivered us out of the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son. The entire biblical message of redemption and the historical establishing of God's kingdom both presuppose the antithesis then between the people of God and the culture of unbelief, between the regenerate and the unregenerate. Therefore, throughout history, Satan has tempted God's people to compromise the antithesis, whether by intermingling in ungodly marriages in Genesis 5, or by showing unwarranted tolerance toward the enemies of God, as we read in the book of Joshua, or by departing from the authority of God's word so that every man does what is right in his own eyes, as we read in the book of Judges, or by committing spiritual adultery with other gods, as we read of in the prophets, or trusting in some other power than God, as we read of in the prophets, or by repudiating the Messiah along with the world, as John tells us in his gospel, chapter 1 or by bowing the knee both to Christ and to Caesar, as we read of in Revelation 13. In fact, Satan even dared to tempt Jesus, the Son of God, to achieve God's ends by compromising the antithesis with Satan himself. In Matthew, the fourth chapter, you remember how Satan showed Jesus the kingdoms of the world, and he said all of them would belong to Jesus if he would just bow his knee to Satan. Of course, they belong to Jesus anyway. Satan was proposing a shortcut. If we would live up to Paul's assessment that Christians are not ignorant of Satan's devices, 2 Corinthians 2.11, then we must be sure not to ignore the tempter's persistent device of suggesting that we can tone down or disregard the antithesis which God has imposed between his people and the world. Now, this antithesis 
is made evident in the biblical drama immediately after its institution by God in Genesis 3. In the fourth chapter of Genesis, as I'm sure you know, we read that Cain murdered his brother Abel because God had respect unto Abel's offering instead of Cain. The antagonism between those who please God and those who do not was already at work then in human history. And John tells us specifically that this event illustrated the enmity which arises between the two seeds, for he says, Cain was of the evil one. He was the seed of the serpent and slew his brother precisely because his works were evil and his brother's righteous, 1 John 3.12. The antithesis continues to be pressed in the literature of the Bible as the descendants of Cain and their accompanying culture are now distinguished from those of Seth in the fourth chapter of Genesis. The family of Noah is set apart from the rest of mankind for preservation through the flood in Genesis 5 to 9. The seed of Shem is set apart from the seed of his brothers in Genesis 10. The ungodly attempt to unify all mankind at the Tower of Babel is thwarted by God in Genesis 11. Abraham and his seed are specifically chosen out of all the other families of the earth, Genesis 12 to 15. The line of Isaac is chosen over that of Ishmael, Genesis 16 to 18. The line of Jacob over that of Esau in Genesis 25, and eventually the children of Israel are called out of the land of Egypt, as the book of Exodus shows us, to displace the Canaanite tribes and be established as a holy people unto God in the book of Joshua. Accompanying these biblical stories, we read repeatedly of the hostility which exists between God's children and those of the world, whether we look at Ishmael's persecuting mockery of Isaac in Genesis 21.9, or Pharaoh's harsh and murderous oppression of the Jewish slaves in Exodus 1, or Israel's military campaigns against Canaan's abominable places of worship in Deuteronomy 7 and 12. The theme of antithesis thus runs through the Bible like a subtle unifying thread. We hear the theme of antithesis in the imprecatory psalms against God's enemies, and in the prophetic denunciation of the nations, especially against the ruthless empires of Assyria and Babylon, which took God's chosen people into captivity. The necessity of living in terms of the antithesis is buttressed by the Mosaic Law's demand that God's chosen people be a holy people, separated from pagan unbelief and practices, Leviticus chapter 11, which is quoted in 1 Peter 1. Where Peter says we are to be sanctified in all manner of living. It was reiterated in the call of the prophets to come out from among them and be separate and touch no unclean. Jeremiah 31, Isaiah 52, which you recall, of course, is quoted by Paul in 2 Corinthians 6. We are to be cleansed from all defilement of flesh and spirit. Now, both of these moral injunctions assume and endorse an antithesis between the lifestyle of believers and unbelievers and both injunctions are repeated for us in the New Testament. We had better take them seriously. In the New Testament, we see further evidence of, and a demand for, the antithesis between the church and the world. Jesus emphasized and called for a clear observation of that antithesis when he proclaimed, He who is not with me is against me, Matthew 12.30, because he said, No man can serve two masters, Matthew 6.24. And Jesus identified the enemy, that language is conspicuous, the enemy of the kingdom, Matthew 13, 39, as Satan. Peter called him the believer's adversary, 1 Peter 5, 8. And Paul utilized military imagery to rouse us to withstand the principalities and powers the spiritual host of wickedness in Ephesians 6. There is, accordingly, in the New Testament outlook, clearly a hostile encounter taking place in the world. A graphic illustration of the antithesis or the enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed which belongs to God is found in the account of Elymas, the sorcerer, who Paul denounced as, quote, a son of the devil because he opposed the apostles by trying to turn aside Sergius Paulus from the faith and by always, Paul said, perverting the right ways of the Lord, Acts 13. We should call Genesis 3.15 to mind again when Jesus calls those who oppose the kingdom of God the sons of the evil one in Matthew 13.38. And Paul identifies them as the enemies 
of Christ's cross who mind earthly things in contrast to the Christian's heavenly citizenship, Philippians 3. The Apostle John reinforces the necessity of the antithesis by issuing this command to believers in 1 John 2.15, Love not the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And James drives home the antithesis pungently by declaring, Whoever would be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. To end our short survey, we can finally observe that the antithesis will once and for all be ultimately confirmed by the eternal separation of all men into either heaven or hell, as Jesus taught in Matthew, the 25th chapter. Now then, the primary significance for apologetics of the biblical teaching that there is a fundamental, everlasting, and unreconcilable antithesis between the regenerate and the unregenerate is found in the observation that this antithesis applies just as much to the mental life and conduct of men as it does to their other affairs. The enmity between Satan's seed and God's seed, which is seminally spoken of in Genesis 3.15, is intellectual in nature, as well as social or familial or economic or military or political or what have you. Consider the words of Paul in Romans 8.7. The mind of the flesh is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. The mentality of those who are unregenerate, those who are in the flesh, cannot subject itself to the truth of God's word. There is, then, no peace between the mindset of the unbeliever and the mind of God. They are rather at enmity with each other. Paul similarly describes the unregenerate, unreconciled spiritual condition of unbelievers in Colossians 1.21 when he says they are alienated and enemies in their mind enemies in their mind against God. The enmity is specifically one which is worked out in the mind or thinking of the unbeliever. The unbeliever is unable to be subject to the law's greatest command, which is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Instead, the unbeliever hates the wisdom and instruction of God, as Proverbs 1.7 puts it. Although the fear of the Lord is the beginning, the very starting point of knowledge, there is no fear of God before the unbeliever's eyes, as Paul tells us in Romans 3. He is, as such, kept from realizing any of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge deposited in Christ, Colossians 2, 3. The unbeliever's intellectual enmity against God is simultaneously his epistemological undoing. Paul concisely lays out the epistemological enmity of which we are speaking, and he plainly points to its consequences in Colossians 2, verse 8. And I read for you, Take heed lest anyone rob you, that is, rob you of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, spoken of in verse 3 preceding, Take heed lest anyone rob you of the treasures of knowledge through his philosophy, even its vain deceit, which is after the tradition of men, after the rudimentary assumptions of the world, and not after Christ. Here Paul sets a philosophy which is after Christ, in antithesis to one which is after worldly presuppositions. His word is rudiments, the elementary principles of learning, and human tradition. And Paul says that the latter will have the effect of depriving those who maintain it of knowledge. Those who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, he says in Romans 1, are not only without excuse for their line of reasoning, but they also become vain in their reasoning, their senseless hearts being darkened. Unbelieving philosophy is not philosophy, etymologically, the love of wisdom. The arguments of unregenerate men against the Christian faith are thus only, as Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, the oppositions of knowledge falsely so-called. The foolish reasoning of those that, Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, oppose themselves in the process of prosecuting their enmity against God. Now, the apologists must realize these implications and thereby seek to expose the utter epistemological futility of the unbeliever's reasoning. Paul's challenge was this. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? 1 Corinthians 1.20. It was his conviction that because the unregenerate mind is at enmity with God's word and spirit, and thus also with the thinking of God's people who are renewed in the spirit of their minds, according to Ephesians 4, 
Unbelievers, whether they're scholars or not, walk in the vanity of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardening of their hearts. For if ever there was an indictment line upon line, Paul gives it in Ephesians 4, 17 and 18. The defender of the faith, who is faithful to the biblical faith he defends, will not seek to diminish or abandon the crucial antithesis which exists between the philosophical reasoning of the regenerate mind and the self-destructive reasoning of the unregenerate mind. He will, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, cast down reasonings and every lofty thing exalted against the knowledge of God, taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. The antithesis will be, must be, central and indispensable to the work of the apologist as an ambassador for Christ in the intellectual arena who beseeches men, what? To be reconciled to God. 2 Corinthians 5.20. And so I hope that this would satisfy Van Til's call that we be biblical first. The enmity, the antithesis, is essential to the biblical understanding of man. But, as number two in your outline indicates, modern thought disregards and disdains the antithesis. The spirit of our age, the spirit of our culture, is not only antithetical to the perspective of God's spirit as generally revealed in the scriptures. It is in particular antithetical to the biblical view of antithesis. The enmity or antithesis between the regenerate and the unregenerate mind as presaging the final antithesis of heaven and hell is renounced by the modern spirit in the hope that all the world might someday live as one. This erasing of the antithesis was the motivating theme an arousing sentiment of the song popularized by ex-Beatle John Lennon, in which he proposed, Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us, only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. The song went on to preach that we should imagine there is no country, no possessions, and no religion, too, so that we might finally achieve a brotherhood of man where any and all antithesis, especially that proclaimed by the Bible, will be eliminated forever in a social, political, economical, and religious monism of perpetual peace. It all begins, sings the modern siren, by imagining that there is no heaven and no hell. The God-ordained antithesis must not be conceded, even where the expression of the modern spirit is not as pronounced or as poetic as John Lennon's song. We see the subtle disregard for the biblical antithesis exhibited around us every day in the media. The contemporary spirit is one of egalitarian democracy and enlightened tolerance. These attributes are nothing if not meant to be all-encompassing. It is not enough that political democracy permits one to believe as he sees fit. There is as well the epistemological democracy, which insists that no belief system is inherently superior to any other. The biblical antithesis between light and darkness between God-honoring wisdom and God-defying foolishness, between the mind of the spirit and the mind of the flesh, is an offense to the modern mentality. No one has the warrant to deem his perspective as more authoritative or imbued with any special epistemological privilege over others. All philosophical points of view must be rendered equal honor as worthy of our attention and having something worthwhile to contribute to our thinking. We must respect each other Accordingly, our age is characterized by intellectual pluralism and the spirit of rapprochement, not at all by a recognition of a regard for a categorical antithesis between Christian and non-Christian viewpoints. The result of neglecting the God-ordained perspectival antithesis between Christianity and the world is, as one might naturally expect, a failure of nerve in maintaining any distinctive and unqualified religious truth a truth which would stand out clearly over against every view which falls short of or runs counter to it. Nobody's wrong if everybody's right has come to be the unwitting operating premise of modern theology. The cognitive agnosticism of post-Kantian religious thought precludes identifying any clear-cut line of demarcation between truth and error and renders the advocating of one a disreputable social faux pas. 
Just try going to a modern theological academic meeting and proposing that only Christianity understands what's going on. Modern theology is accordingly simply loath to press the fundamental antithesis between scholarship which submits to the revealed word of God and autonomous reasoning which either ignores it or denies it. The inevitable result of suppressing this antithesis is that Christian theology loses its basic character and joins hands with what should be its very opposite, religious relativism. That is what has transpired in our age of anti-antithesis. For instance, there are no genuine heretics in the thinking of modern theologians for the same reason that there are no citations for indecent exposure in a nudist colony. <laughs> the preconditions for making those charges simply don't hold. Now, this is candidly illustrated by the text which I consider the most thorough and the most descriptively competent survey available for contemporary theology and philosophy of religion, one that was written by no less a scholar than the Lady Margaret Professor of Divinity in the University of Oxford. In his book, 20th Century Religious Thought, John McQuarrie demonstrates a remarkable familiarity with the wide-ranging scope of philosophical trends which have interfaced with religious reflection since 1900. He reviews it all. It's amazing. Personalism, vitalism, phenomenology, positivism, neo-Thomism, process philosophy, linguistic analysis, existentialism, the social gospel, post-liberal thought, neo-orthodoxy. And they're all there. Josiah Royce, A.E. Taylor, Harnack, Freud, Collingwood, Trolls, William James, Berdaya, Husserl, Tillyard, Wittgenstein, Rahner, Niebuhr, Tillich, Ryle, and I haven't mentioned half of the people he discusses. They're all there and much more. McQuarrie has undoubtedly mastered the field of modern theological thought, and, admittedly, his insights and evaluations of particular themes or particular authors are often beneficial. But what has McQuarrie learned from all this? What conclusions would he draw from his study of 20th century religious thought? He's quite open about that matter in his chapter, Concluding Comments, the first subsection of which is some findings and suggestions where we there read the Oxford scholar writing, and I quote at length here, our survey, however, has undoubtedly pointed us in the direction of a degree of relativism. Absolute and final truth on the questions of religion is just unattainable. Although absolute truth is denied us, we can have partial insights of varying degrees of adequacy, glimpses that would make us less forlorn. What we're driving at is that just as we have no absolute answers, so we have no absolute questions in which everything would be noticed at once. Only God could either ask or answer such questions. Our questions arise out of our situation, and both questions and answers are relative to that situation. This need not distress us, for it could not be otherwise. It is part of what it means to be finite. We have seen there are many possible ways of understanding religion. And no one way is likely to be the final truth. This is the situation in which finite man has got to make up his mind, an agonizing situation, if you like, but also a challenging and adventurous one. So Kierkegaard viewed Christianity, not as a cozy convention, but as a decision to be taken and a leap to be made. End of quote. McQuarrie, who I think is representative of the modern mentality, is unwilling to countenance the radical antithesis, the God-imposed enmity between belief grounded in God's holy word and unbelief. At best, he sees the theological situation as, he quotes, I quote him, sorry, a dialogue among free men who, adrift together in religious relativism and uncertainty, must make an adventuresome leap of faith since there is no final truth regarding religion for us as finite creatures whose thinking is dependent upon our local situation. Of course, as Macquarie recognizes, God himself might provide absolute answers which would lift us above our human limitations. And Macquarie is well aware that, and I quote him, some theologians talk of an absolute divine revelation to which they have access. But then he promptly dismisses that as dogmatic and arrogant, a perspective which has difficulties due to interpreting the revelation. The farce in all this, I hope, is only too apparent. McQuarrie himself is no less dogmatic and arrogant in pronouncing that absolute and final truth on religious questions is just unattainable. He is absolute in his declaration that nothing is absolute. 
On the question of religious insight, McQuarrie's own final truth is that there can be no final truth. Now, this flagrant contradiction complements the subtle but just as real contradiction in his statement that varying degrees of adequacy can be recognized in different religious insights, despite the fact that absolute truth is denied us. When a final truth a religious standard is ruled out. On what basis could anyone judge the degree of approximation to the truth in any proposed religious idea? What kind of adequacy does Macquarie expect religious insights to achieve, if not adequacy regarding their veracity? We might ask, is it a religious truth that truth is irrelevant to religious adequacy? The modern mind prefers such unpardonable lapses of intellectual cogency to the fearsome antithesis which an absolute divine revelation would represent in necessity. Dr. Van Til taught us that the tendency toward irrationalism in modern thought, the tendency that is toward skepticism, uncertainty, relativism, acceptance of incoherence, is in fact allied with the tendency toward autonomous rationalism in modern thought, the tendency to exalt man's natural intellect as a final judge using the standards of logic or science. The reflective modern man wants it both ways. His intellect is adequate and authoritative, but not really adequate enough or finally authoritative. The arrogant demands of rationalism are counterbalanced by the humble concessions of irrationalism, and then the misgivings of irrationalism are shored up by the assurances of rationalism. Van Til pointed out, that ironically, the two tendencies toward rationalism and irrationalism actually call for each other. In the intellectual challenge of the gospel, he said, there's nothing surprising in the fact that modern man is both utterly irrationalist and utterly rationalist at the same time. He has to be both in order to be either. And this is precisely what we see in the example of Dr. Macquarie. Leaning toward irrationalism, he rules out absolute or final truth in religion, affirms that all of our questions and answers are relative, says we must be content with a leap of faith, and settles for glaring contradictions in the course of telling us so. He then turns around, and on the very next page, asserts an autonomous rationalism as his intellectual guide. Let me quote. He says, our understanding of religion should be a reasonable one. That'd be nice. By this is not meant that some conclusive proof is to be given, for we have already rejected the possibility of absolute certainty. In asking for a reasonable understanding of religion, we simply mean that it should involve no sacrificium intellectus, no sacrifice of the intellect, no flagrant contradictions, no violation of natural reason, no conflict with what we believe about the world on scientific or common sense ground. Now this conspicuous exhibition of the rational-irrational tension in the thinking of a learned modern thinker is pertinent to our subject matter in this lecture, for we can discern here the same suppression of antithesis on both sides of Macquarie's dialectic. On the irrationalist side, there can be no antithesis between divine truth and rebellious unbelief, for all religious insights are relative. All men are together in the same situation, a common dialogue where final absolute truth is unattainable. Likewise, on the rationalist side of the dialectic, there can be no antithesis between divine truth and rebellious unbelief, for again, all men are together in the same situation, refusing to sacrifice the autonomy of their intellect, honoring the demands of natural reason, as he himself says, and common sense, and never believing anything contrary to what we believe about the world on the basis of science. We, any man, on the basis of generic science. All men are alike. Whether servants or enemies of Jesus Christ, all men alike are lumped together by Macquarie in his rationalist methodology, autonomous intellect is judge, even as they are lumped together in his irrationalist conclusion. There is no final truth. A fundamental religious antithesis and method and conclusion cannot be recognized by him. Now, this is also true of one of the leading analytical philosophers of our age, Stephen Toolman, who for the sake of time I'm not going to tell you much about in terms of his book, The Uses of Argument, but one might have been led to think that given Toolman's remarks in The Uses of Argument, that he would recognize the difference between Christian and non-Christian thinking. 
That at least would be a possibility given the themes of that book. However, Toulmin has recently published a remarkable book entitled The Return to Cosmology, in which he addresses the interplay of science and the theology of nature, arguing in the face of modern antagonism to the idea that questions about the universe as a whole and about man's place in it should not be dismissed. Toulmin wants to return to comprehensive questions about the nature of the universe as a whole. The cosmological reflection, which benefits from the dual input, he says, of natural science and religious philosophy. At the very end of the book, where he discusses the future of cosmology, he makes the following observation. If there is to be a renewal of contacts between science and theology along the line suggested here, if the cosmological presuppositions involved in talking about the overall scheme of things are to be scrutinized jointly from both sides of the fence, we shall quickly encounter some knotty problems of jurisdiction. Now you see, Toulmin is sharp enough to realize that, and I quote him, sectarian disagreement and doctrinal particularism stand in the way of developing an effective common cosmology in terms of which men can agree about their place and responsibility in the universe. The cosmology whose pursuit he endorses, therefore, is one which will not offend the natural reason of man, his words. In the second to last paragraph of his book, he writes, and I quote at length, Yet, does this put us in a position to claim quite baldly that the entire scheme of creation by which our moral and religious ideas are to be guided is transparent to the natural reason without regard for the doctrinal considerations of particular religions and sects? Preachers who exhort good Christians to let their Christianity permeate all their thinking so that they may even end up, say, with a Christian arithmetic, invite Leibniz's objection that arithmetic is just not like that. Even God himself cannot alter or contravene the truths of arithmetic. And if we were told that good Christians must subscribe to a different science of ecology from other people, a parallel objection might well be pressed. God intervenes in the world, Leibniz declared, within the realm of grace, not within the realm of nature. So perhaps the time has come to take our courage in both hands and declare for a fully common and ecumenical theology of nature. Page 274. Truman is willing to return to cosmological thinking just so long as any antithesis between a Christian theology of nature and any non-Christian conception is ruled out in advance. The Christian perspective is to be confined to the realm of grace, not allowed to create sectarian disputes within the realm of nature. The last thing that the modern mind is willing to accept is a distinctively Christian mathematics, a distinctively Christian natural science, a distinctively Christian anything. The antithesis must be removed if Christians are to dialogue with other religionists, philosophers, or scientists. Everyone must be respected for having a perspective which contributes to the rich understanding of the ultimately mysterious universe. No special place may be afforded to Christian perspective. Now, Toulmin immediately states that his fully ecumenical enterprise, what he calls a theology of nature accessible to the common reason, he immediately states that this will not win universal support due to the intolerance of fundamentalist theology. But even if it did, if all perspectives would accept the rationalist requirement of a common, autonomous intellectual method, we have to ask, would Toulmin's ecumenical theology of nature prove successful? Would it bring us an assured knowledge of the grand scheme of things and man's place in the universe? In the very last paragraph of his book, Toulmin asked, just how far then can the natural reason alone inform us in detail about what the overall scheme of things, the cosmos, the creation, really is? His answer, or better, his non-answer, ends the book, the very last sentence. We have reached the threshold of some plainly difficult and confusing questions, but answering them is a task for the future. Toulmin, the philosopher, has thus returned, along with the theologian query, to the irrationalist modern tendency toward uncertainty and skepticism. The questions are so tough that nobody can really know for sure. The substitute, you see, for a distinctively Christian answer turns out to be, as always, the eschatological cop-out invoked by autonomous thought. 
Answering the ultimate questions must ever remain a task for the future. The modern repudiation of the antithesis between the regenerate and unregenerate minds, between the Christian worldview and its competitors, is itself ironically a reiteration of that very antithesis. Macquarie's promotion of religious relativism and Toulmin's rejection of any distinctively Christian cosmology both take their stand over against the Christ speaking in the scriptures. Contrary to the thesis proclaimed by Christ, the modern man asserts its antithesis. The God-ordained enmity between belief and unbelief cannot ever be successfully overcome, you see. In its effort to supplant it, unbelieving scholarship simply ends up supporting it. However, that such a vain effort to eliminate antithesis between biblical Christianity and its opponents is made by worldly scholars should come probably as no surprise. After all, respect for and condoning of that antithesis would be implicitly self-condemning. And John 3.20 tells us it is precisely an escape from God's condemnation which unbelievers seek. The remarkable thing is that even professedly Christian scholars would likewise make the vain effort to eliminate the antithesis between biblical philosophy and unbiblical speculation. The penchant of modern theologians and churchmen to ignore the inherent antagonism between the perspective of God's holy word and the perspectives developed by men who suppress or dispute biblical truth agonized Van Til to the depth of his God-fearing soul. By stressing commonality rather than conflict, such theologians surely find themselves more pleasing to men, said Van Til, but they do so at the price of coming under the displeasure of God. The God who in the Garden of Eden himself imposed the inescapable enmity between his people and the world. Thus, in the great debate today of 1970, Van Til eschewed the lead of modern liberal and neo-orthodox pundits in order to follow Augustine in teaching that the city of God and the city of man stand over against one another in their total outlook with respect to the whole course of history. In the Reformed Pastor in Modern Thought of 1971, Van Til argued against the apostate and man-centered ecumenicism of contemporary speculation, an ecumenicism which, to be consistent, must acknowledge that even the radically anti-Christian proposals of Teilhard de Chardin and the God is Dead proponent should not be kept out of the church. In books such as The Sovereignty of Grace and The New Hermeneutic, 1969-1974 respectively, Van Til warned against the synthesis between Christianity and post-Kantian thought, which is the dangerous drift in the teaching of the later Burkhauer and Kiger. We cannot help but notice then that the message of antithesis is disregarded by worldly thinkers and theologians of perspectival synthesis. However, the one who above all wishes to see a dissolving of the antithesis of regenerate and unregenerate thinking in the favor of synthesis, ecumenicism, and a common faith of an autonomous humanistic character, above unbelieving philosophers and defecting theologians, is the one upon whom that antithesis was originally pronounced as a curse, Satan himself. This is, in fact, his most effective tool against the redemptive plan of God and against the maturation of the Messiah's kingdom in history. This is his last best hope, that the gates of hell might after all prevail against the church of Christ. For according to philosophical reflection which disregards the antithesis between the two seeds, there is in principle no necessity for a fundamental clash between the church and hell's gates anyway. Satan gladly works through the polemics of autonomous philosophers, gladly works through the polemics of relativistic ecumenical theologians to badger or tempt God's people to compromise the antithesis in their reasoning and scholarship, and he would especially have us lay aside any theoretical or practical application of the fact that the unbeliever's enmity against God and his people comes to expression precisely in his intellectual life or his thinking. Satan does so just because the Bible's message of redemption, as well as the historical work of Christ and his spirit in establishing God's kingdom, both presuppose a powerful, systematically basic, and intrinsic antithesis between the cultures of regenerate and unregenerate men. And yet, as number three now on your outline indicates, a false conception of the needed antithesis 
answers apologetics. We draw the simple but significant conclusion, therefore, that it always has been and ever will be the case in the history of Christ's church that any genuinely faithful and effective work of Christian scholarship, preaching, missions, or apologetics requires the believer to be aware of and to work in the guiding light of the pervasive biblical message of antithesis. And this summons to proclaim and apply the antithesis in the pursuit of our ministries is especially urgent in our modern day of intellectual relativism, antipathy to distinctively Christian methods and conclusions, and theological compromise regarding the doctrine, discipline, and worship of Christ's church. One might think, then, we would welcome any Christian scholar or writer who makes the summons back to antithesis central to his encounter with modern culture. But this is not entirely the case. In a rather odd way, some conceptions of the antithesis to which we call the attention of thinking men can unwittingly, but nevertheless really, work to undermine the very antithesis which is presented in and essential to the biblical viewpoint. That is, a false or misconstrued conception of the necessary antithesis could actually have the effect of hampering Christian apologetics by denying the antithesis which is thoroughly needed that our day needs to recognize. I believe that this is what we find in the case of Francis Schaeffer's apologetical work and writing. For those familiar with the popular and prolific publications which came from the pen of our dear brother, Dr. Schaeffer, cannot easily forget his polemic in favor of antithetical thinking. At the back of his book, The God Who Was There, Schaeffer defined the word antithesis very simply as direct opposition or contrast between two things. He can also be found in that book using the word for the point of conversion when the individual passes from death to life, calling that the personal antithesis. However, Schaeffer's more characteristic and basic use of the concept of antithesis is associated with themes which are pivotal in his defense of the faith. Themes like, one, the claim that knowledge precedes faith, thus opening the door to a pre-evangelism based not on scriptural truth or authority, but on the unbeliever's awareness of the form of the external universe and the management of man. Two, the requirement that any proof, whether in science, philosophy, or religion, show that a theory is non-contradictory, that it explains the phenomenon in question, and that it can be lived with consistently. Three, the treatment of Christian and non-Christian presuppositions simply as hypotheses which are judged by the test of which that fits the facts, as he puts it explicitly, and he is there and he is not silent. Four, a commendable emphasis on the non-Christian's inability to live logically with his presuppositions, but then especially, five, Schaefer's notion of a cultural crisis whereby modern man has been forced to pass below the line of despair, as he puts it. We see this throughout the God who is there. We see it throughout Escape from Reason. It is in connection with this last theme that Schaefer became famous, and I think in some circles infamous, for his sweeping surveys and evaluations of the history of philosophy and the arts, the gist of which was definitively set down in his book from 1976, How Should We Then Live?, subtitled The Rise and Decline of Western Thought and Culture. According to Schaefer's various books, the major turning point for modern man the philosophical development which left him under the line of despair without hope for rationality or a unified field of knowledge was the advent of Hegelian philosophy. I quote, It was the German philosopher Hegel who became the first man to open the door into the line of despair. Schaefer explains that, and I quote, Before this, in epistemology, man always thought in terms of antithesis, that is, the first step in classical logic. In antithesis, if this is true, then its opposite is not true. Quote. Just listen to Schaefer's various statements of the destructive error in Hegel's thinking, the error which he says is at the heart of modern man's philosophical and cultural crisis. And I'm going to give you a list of these because he does this in just about every book. In The God Who Was There, I quote, Before his time, before Hegel's time, truth was conceived on the basis of antithesis. Truth in the sense of antithesis is related to the idea of cause and effect. Cause and effect produces a chain reaction which goes straight on in a horizontal line. 
With the coming of Hegel, all this changed. Hegel proposed, from now on, let us think in this way. Instead of thinking in terms of cause and effect, what we really have is a thesis, an opposite is an antithesis, and the answer to their relationship is not in the horizontal movement of cause and effect, but the answer is always synthesis. Thus, instead of antithesis, Schaefer says, we have this modern man's approach to truth, synthesis. Let me quote from He is There and He is Not Silent. Hegel argued that antithesis has never turned out well on a rationalistic basis, so he proposed to change the methodology of epistemology. Instead of dealing with antithesis, let us deal with synthesis. So he set up his famous triangle. Everything is a thesis. It sets up its antithesis. The answer is always a synthesis. He thus changed the whole theory of how we know. Or, let me read from Escape from Reason. What did Hegel say? He argued that attempts had been made for thousands of years to find an answer on the basis of antithesis, and they had not come to anything. Philosophic humanistic thought had tried to hang on to rationalism, rationality, and a unified field of knowledge, and it has not succeeded. Thus, he said, we must try a new suggestion. He changed the rules of the game in two areas, epistemology, the theory of knowledge, and limits, and validity of knowledge, and methodology, the method by which we approach the question of truth and knowing. What he said was this, we let us no longer think in terms of antithesis, let us rather think in terms of thesis, antithesis, with the answer always being synthesis. And then Schaefer goes on to comment that a choice was made, and the choice consisted in holding on to rationalism at the expense of rationality. In his major work on the history of philosophy and culture, Schaefer contends that, and I'm quoting, non-Christian philosophers from the time of the Greeks until just before our modern period had in common with each other that they took reason seriously. They accepted the validity of reason, that the mind thinks in terms of antithesis. The first lessons in classical logic were A is A, and A is not non-A. That's what he says in um, How Should We Then Live? But then, according to Schaeffer, there came a shift in philosophy, a shift toward romanticism, and with it a pessimism regarding rationality. And this shift was the responsibility, he says, of Rousseau, Kant, Hegel, and Kierkegaard. And it created, he thinks, the characteristic mark of modern man, namely, that the lower realm of reason is taken to lead inevitably to despair and is totally separated from the upper realm of values, meaning, and optimism. Now, listen. When Schaefer addresses Hegel's role in this development, Schaefer mentions the dialectical unfolding of history whereby successively new syntheses are formed through the perception that there is truth in both thesis and antithesis. Schaefer concludes that, and I'm quoting, although it is an, it is an oversimplification of Hegel's complete position, the result is that all possible particular positions are indeed relativized. This is led to the idea that truth is to be sought in synthesis rather than antithesis. What we find in the major works of Francis Schaeffer, then, is a conspicuous insistence upon and call for thinking in terms of antithesis. The Christian's witness to his modern culture and the apologetical solution that Schaeffer offers to our culture's philosophical despair involves the proclamation of antithesis over against the relativizing tendency of synthesis thinking in Hegel and the post hegelian Now, given our earlier discussion of the biblical view of antithesis between believer and unbeliever, as well as the disastrous consequences of modern culture's suppression of that antithesis, can we now welcome and endorse the position of Schaefer on the subject of antithesis? Can we eagerly enlist the works of Schaefer in our project? of restoring a consciousness of the antithesis to contemporary Christian scholarship. Sadly, we can't do so at all. Not at all. Schaefer's view of the needed antithesis is, in fact, a further evidence of disregard for the antithesis, which the Bible teaches. I want to say that again, because that's crucial. Schaefer's view of the needed antithesis is in fact a further evidence of disregard for the antithesis which the Bible teaches. The reason for saying this is that Schaefer's understanding of antithesis does not call for or demand 
a distinctively Christian or biblical over against non-Christian conception of rationality and logic. Now, I'm speaking here of Schaeffer's conception of rationality and logic not being distinctively Christian. I'm talking about his theory or his philosophy of logic. We're not now talking about the particular laws or details of logical application which any freshman takes in college. That's not what we're calling for a distinctively Christian difference in. The theory of logic that leads to the application of those laws, however, is not distinctively different. Schaefer does not press a choice between apostate thought and regenerate philosophy, but rather a choice between Hegel and the Greeks, despite the fact that the Greeks were as unregenerate in their theorizing and worldviews as any philosopher who have gained attention in Western history. Schaefer's desired antithesis draws no antithesis, then, between Christianity and the world. The antithesis he wants is acceptable to both and understood commonly. Schaeffer's desired antithesis simply substitutes an older version of humanistic thought for a newer one. And in so doing, it is not true to the biblical antithesis itself. You see, Paul could challenge the philosophical Greeks of his day, that is, the day of Schaeffer's desired antithetical reasoning. Paul could challenge those Greeks, where is the wise? Where is the disputer of this age? Hasn't God made foolish the wisdom of this world? The development and demonstration of the foolishness of apostate thought did not await the advent of Hegel. The despair of unbelieving philosophy was just as clear in the days of ancient Greek speculation, just as clear in the Greek versions of logic must be observed as well, so we cannot endorse Schaeffer's animate versions against Hegelian synthesis in favor of Schaeffer's own conception of antithesis, because Schaeffer has misconstrued the philosophy of Hegel on a massive scale, presenting a view of him which Hegel would never have recognized or condoned. I think the reader is alerted to the strong likelihood that something has gone seriously amiss in Schaeffer's discussion of antithesis and synthesis as well as in his representation of Hegel's views, when we see Schaeffer somehow confusing logical and causal analysis of the concept of antithesis and running the paradigmatically rationalist philosopher Hegel in with the philosophical streams of Romanticism and Relativism. Similarly, Schaeffer misses the mark widely in portraying Hegel as choosing to think in terms of synthesis instead of antithesis, when in fact Hegel saw the latter, antithesis, as a necessary step in the inevitable, there's no choice about it, achieving of synthesis. But the largest mistake of all in Schaeffer's discussion is his suggestion that the Hegelian synthesis somehow meant the sacrifice of rationality, the validity of reason, and the logical law of non-contradiction. Hegel's proposals were not on this order whatsoever, and we certainly do not enhance our position in the academic world when we Christians cannot get our opponents right. It was not logical consistency which Hegel berated. Indeed, he forcibly advocated a coherence view of truth. What Hegel deemed inadequate was finite man's conceptualizing of reality and giving it rational expression. In the preface to Phenomenology of Mind, Hegel said, the true is the whole. Therefore, any set of propositions which falls short of being a complete system covering the whole of reality will, due to their incompletion, generate their own inadequacies or contradictions. The categories we use in our logical thinking are not definitive, according to Hegel. They are rather tentative and provisional. Between a thesis and its antithesis, there will be dynamic tension because both positions contain something which is rational in them, yet both prove to be inadequate in themselves. The whole point of coming to a synthetic resolution of the tension is then not to renounce logical consistency, but precisely to preserve what is rational in both positions and cancel out what was irrational. All contradictions will be reconciled and all falsity removed in the dialectical unfolding of our thinking 
only when our system of thought is complete, at which point it will have developed into a complete unity with the object of thought, the reality or content of which we are thinking about. Hegel's dialectical method does not view the world as a collection of externally related discrete things. It rather encourages us to understand reality as an evolving process. As such, Hegel's philosophy warns us against taking any given stage of the developmental process in thought or in history as fully adequate. It is not wholly mistaken, but Hegel says it is nevertheless only a misleading representation of what shall ultimately develop from it, even as a tadpole stands to a frog. An illustration that Aristotle would have been happy with, by the way, that ancient Greek philosopher. This philosophical perspective may or may not be radically muddle-headed, and it may or it may not be overly humble about finite man's ability to conceptualize ultimate truth, but it is still miles from being the renunciation of logical validity and rational thinking which Francis Schaeffer paints it to be. So our bottom line assessment of Schaeffer's plea for the renewal of antithesis over against the synthesis of modern thought is that he misconstrued the Hegelian thought which he heatedly opposed, and at the same time overlooked the true nature of that antithetical thinking to which God's word calls us as Christians. Our challenge should be for Greeks and Hegelians alike to make sense of their use of logical laws, given their presuppositions about reality, man, and knowledge. We should show them that given their perspectives on life and thought, the existence and the normativity of abstract logical principles is just unintelligible. Their rationalism and philosophical speculation does not comport with their presupposed irrationalism about the world. Given their worldview, they cannot justify then the most elementary laws of thought, even those like the Barbara syllogism which Christians and non-Christians use alike. Thinking themselves to be wise, they have in principle become fools instead. The vanity of unbelieving philosophical thought, as presented in the Bible, is not the exclusive province of ancient or modern culture. It is the result of that primal enmity which stands between God or his people and all apostate cultures indiscriminately. The apologetical outlook of Francis Schaeffer was unfortunately not sufficiently perceptive of that fact. Ironically, even though one of the major thrusts of Schaeffer's scholarship was to repudiate the dichotomy of lower story nature, the external particulars, and upper story grace, conceptual value and meaning, Schaeffer's apologetical method reintroduced a nature grace dichotomy of its own. According to Schaeffer, the philosophical challenge issued by the apologist does not pertain to the natural order. For unregenerate man can make sense of his world scientifically and logically as far as he goes. What the apologist is supposed to show, according to Schaefer, is that there is more to reality, another realm, another dimension, which the unbeliever's thinking has simply not touched. What is wrong with the non-Christian perspective on the physical world is not that it is, in principle, unintelligible, but simply that it is incomplete. And thus Schaefer says, to the materialist philosopher or scientist, after he has expounded what he knows about the universe, and I'm quoting from Death in the City, Schaefer says to him, this is all very fine, but it's drastically incomplete. It's as if you had taken an orange, sliced it in half, and only concerned yourself with one of the halves. To really understand reality in our universe, you have to consider both halves both the seen and the unseen. You are completely unbalanced. You only know half of your universe. Schaefer then mysteriously comments that between the views of naturalism and supernaturalism, there is, he says, a total antithesis. The two can never be brought into synthesis. But you see, on Schaefer's conception of the difference between believing and unbelieving thought, there is little reason at all that they could not be synthesized. The difference between them is virtually quantitative, not qualitative. The unbeliever merely does not have both halves of the orange. And what he says about the half he does have is all very fine, according to Schaefer's portrayal. Now, an educated friend of mine who has taught apologetics and is justly fond of Schaefer 
for his personal outreach and ministry, once attempted to excuse this faulty and decidedly non-presuppositional analysis of Shaver's by saying that the illustration, the orange illustration, was simply an unfortunate one, that it betrayed minor inconsistencies within Schaefer's alleged presuppositionalism. This is hardly a minor matter in apologetics. Getting things so wrong on this particular point would be akin to a medical doctor making the minor error of confusing his patient's lungs and legs. Moreover, this unfortunate illustration is not at all uncharacteristic of what Schaefer repeatedly says elsewhere. I would have you take, for instance, his notion that believers and unbelievers alike have a presuppositionless perception of the facts. Now, why do I say it's presuppositionless? Because Schaefer says it's the presuppositions that are judged by those facts. They both have a presuppositionless perception of the facts against which they may judge the respective adequacy of the Christian and non-Christian presuppositions. So he says, and he is there and is not silent, Pages 65, 6, and 81. There is apparently no antithesis for Schaefer when it comes to regenerate and unregenerate minds seeing the facts.